Well, hello, WCF. I just want to, first of all, thank Pastor Jake for the worship set that he just put on today. I believe that it was just powerful. I believe that it, it goes forth, that it breaks and it breaks forth in people's lives. And I just believe that as we come to come together in the body of Christ and we worship God, that it's just, it's, it's part of what we were created for was to worship God. And I just believe that God's doing a, he's doing a good thing right now in the area of worship. And he's doing a great thing in the area of prayer as well. You know, uh, Pastor Sherry and myself, we, we get to pray with you guys every day online. We've been excited about that. We just, we, we're good to, it's good to see people growing uh, in their prayer lives with God. We see people are getting closer to God. We see the power of the Holy Spirit being made manifest. And it's just, it's exciting to see what God's really doing with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days. And, and truly it says, you know, that my house shall be called a house of prayer. So anyways, we haven't been with you guys for a couple weeks, but we enjoyed, uh, we've been going through a series right now. We've been doing desperate acts that catch the master's eye. And so we've already went through part one and two. Tonight we're going to be doing part three. And we're kind of, we're going to recap for those, you know, who missed it. We're not going to do a long recap, but on week number one, we talked about the ruler and the outcast. And what we found was, is that these were people that were desperate. They were desperate to get Jesus' attention. And in the ruler's case, he, he, he got, he, he, his, his path was clear. It was plain. He got to the front of the line really quick with his request and his humility and his desperation. But on the journey that he took, it was one that allowed him, he had to grow along this journey. There was contradictions along the way. There was interruptions along the way. But through that process, God exceeded the expectation in his life. And not only did he he said it went from, you know, just asking for healing for his daughter to Christ went and changed that whole situation around and he resurrected his daughter from the dead and he received the miracle of God. But there was a stretching process that was produced in his life. And then we also talked about the outcast that day. This was this woman. She had an issue of blood for 12 years, 12 years of hopelessness, 12 years of, of quarantine and isolation. And as she went through this process, this journey, she, she literally, as she, her faith was so active, Active, that she she reached out and she took a miracle from Christ and she interrupted what his plans were along the way and she received that miracle and when it happened it says that the virtue of God went forth and it healed her she caught the master's eye and she received the the healing that she needed that day and it was a it was a remarkable day and then week two, we recapped, uh, we did the beggar, blind Bartimaeus, and the dog, which was a Canaanite woman. So when we talked about blind Bartimaeus, we talked about how he was on the side of the road and Jesus was passing by with the multitudes and Bartimaeus was crying out to him and, and his name actually meant son of the unclean. And he was crying out and as he cried out to Jesus, he first caught Jesus' ear. And once he caught Jesus' ear, he caught Jesus' eye and Jesus went over and he said, said your faith has made you whole and he was healed from that moment forward and uh, that was really exciting you know yeah. and then we especially because they were all trying to like sh shoosh him yes yeah all right? the, everybody like, around there quiet were, yeah they were trying there was a stigma attached to him and he was a blind man who was a sinner mm -hmm. and uh, and then we also talked about uh, the Canaanite woman and how when Jesus um, you know was trying to take a rest he was in a house and uh, and she came and she sought him out and she had said to him that you know her daughter was possessed with the devil and she wanted her daughter to desperately be healed and Jesus had said you know um, you know we don't throw our food to the dogs basically you know almost calling her a dog and uh, what she heard from that was not that Jesus was calling her a dog, but that even the even the pets, even the family pets got the crumbs from the master's table. And so she said, even if I could just get a crumb from the master's table, that's enough for me. That's, that's what I need. That's what my daughter needs to be healed. And Jesus said, like, your faith has made your daughter whole. And so she left that moment, not even questioning nothing. She went home and she found her daughter completely healed and completely whole. Amen. So you're saying there's a chance. Yeah. Right, and that was, uh, it's exciting to see what ended up happening. She took that little, that little opportunity there and she capitalized on that and her faith grew in that moment where many others would have faltered. And so, you know, as this quarantine period, you know, kind of goes on, you know, I've been, we've been seeing all kinds of different things and new opportunities for people to be able to soar, you know, in their lives. We've been seeing, you know, people who are soaring and starting, you know, with, with their prayer lives. And we've been seeing, you know, their relationship with God, you know, that it's soaring. And, you know, Pastor Sherry and myself, we've, 
we've had, you know, we've been soaring literally, I think, you know, this, this past couple weeks. You know, we've had some different opportunities, you know, where we've been, we've been doing some, uh, you know, rearranging, we'll call it, in the house right now. And with that, it required some painting. That's, that's putting it lightly. But Light, lightly, yes. Another story, another and so time. we were doing some painting. And, you know, when, when you got to pull out the extension ladder inside your house to paint the foyer, you know that you're raising up to new heights. And so we had to pull out the extension ladder, and, and, and Pastor Sherry went up there, and she was, you know, the, the one who was going to be doing the painting. And I think every step that she went up, you know, her legs started shaking a little bit more. And then, the, you know, she kept climbing up, and it was a little bit more shaking. But she had to get up to that, to the higher level in the house to be able to paint that day. It's true. I'm like, I wouldn't really consider myself someone who is necessarily afraid of heights, but I can say that every step that I got closer to the ceiling and further away from the basement floor, because in the foyer, I could see, you know, like the top floor and the basement floor. The closer I got to the ceiling, the further away from the basement floor, my legs, yeah, like you said, they, they were just shaking and I started overheating. And, yep. She's like, and hold the ladder. I'm, I'm, I'm hyperventilated, hyperventilating and I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, I don't even think I'm going to be able to do that. And I'm holding on to the ladder with everything in me. And uh, anyways, it was... Yeah. I, was, I was being a little extra, I guess. Yeah, but yeah, it brought out some emotions, you know. And so if that wasn't enough, you know, we had some high winds over the last little bit. And, uh, you know, I walk outside the other day and I see that the, you know, the, the flashing at the, uh, on the roof of the house has decided that it was going to come off. You know, it was still partially on, but I'm like, are you kidding me? So I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? This is no problem for the quarantine roofer. And so I got out. I got my drill out. I got my screws out. And I went up on that roof. And of course, it has to be be up on the highest peak of the house. And so I'm out there, and, and you know, when you're up there, you know, it's like the flashing, you know, is on the side. It's like the edge of the house. It's not like on the actual roof portion of it. And so literally, I'm like out there, and I'm like sprawled out on the roof like a cat, you know? I'm just like, I'm, I'm on it. I'm hanging on because, you know, I don't really, I don't want to be going anywhere. And literally, what I got to do is I got to like put my, like, I'm, I got the, you know, the, the screwdriver there, you know, the drill, and I got it like reached out over the edge. Edge and I'm drilling in this way, and Pastor Sherry's below, and she's like guiding me like where I can go because I'm not sticking my head out over the edge, you know, and hanging, right? So it was... And then I'm just like standing on the grass, and this was after prayer, and I'm exhausted, and I was ready for a nap. You guys know on Monday I was super tired, and uh, so I'm just up there trying to like just squint up at the seal, up at the sky, hoping that he just doesn't fall off the roof, trying to guide him like, oh, you know, maybe a little bit towards me. He can't see me. He didn't know. <laughs> but anyways, we, we tried to do it. I was trying to make sure he didn't fall off the roof. And thankfully, he did not fall off the roof. As you can see, he is here right now mm -hmm. all intact. We're here. But anyways, so today we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to explore some more stories in the Bible of people who actually went to greater heights to get Jesus' attention. Mm -hmm. So our first passage is actually in Luke 19, and, uh, and this story actually takes place right after blind Bartimaeus. And uh, after he received his sight. And it reminds me of a childhood song that we used to sing. I'm not going to sing it, but, I mean, it went something like, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And All wee right. Little man we, we're going to pass on the singing of this childhood you know, version <laughs> today. It's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> You can get that song stuck in your head. You can. You can. I have had that stuck in my head, I think, all week as you sang it at home. True. I mm -hmm. did. Well, mm -hmm. whenever you're talking about Zacchaeus, you know, you have to sing the song yeah. nonstop. Yeah. Anyways, okay, we're going to read this. We're going to go to the King James Version, Luke 19. I'm going to read 1 to 10. And this is the story of the parasite. We were going to originally call it the scoundrel. Yeah. But then we're like, we're going to call this the parasite. The parasite. You'll find out a little bit later. But it mm -hmm. says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Mm -hmm. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before, and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass by that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him. And he said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and he came down and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be the guest with a man that is a sinner. Mm -hmm. And Zacchaeus stood. And he said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods that I give to the poor... 
Uh, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, this day salvation come, is, this day is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Right. So let's, let's, let's start off with this story where it is, the reality of the situation. It says that, you know, he was, he was the, the, chief of, the chief amongst the publicans, or he was the chief tax collector, and that he was rich. And, you know, even in this initial statement, it kind of brings out two contrasting points in it, because the way that it comes across, it says, it says that, first of all, as a, as a chief of the publicans, as a chief collector, right, it talks about somebody who has some prominence within the community, right? It, it talks about somebody who, who has some wealth. It talks about that he was rich, right? And he, he, he gets to this place of influence, this place of power, because essentially what he does is he's, he's pledging his allegiance to the Roman Empire. And as he pledges his allegiance to the Roman Empire, okay, they're the enemy of the Jews. So, so this is like he, he's taking a side right now with the oppressors of the Jewish people. And so not only is, so, and so they, they pay him handsomely for doing this. They give him a commission. And then it also says, you know, that the way that, that you know, tax collectors often work is they often skimmed off the top of that as well. So they became wealthy people. And so, and so that's the first part. But the second part of this is it implies, right, it talks about how he betrayed the Jews, right? You know, he sold them out. He was not liked by, by the people. He was not liked by the Jewish people because, see, what happened is, is that the, the Roman Empire, they would come in and they would, they would find people within a, a, a group of, you know, whatever that they had conquered and, you know, people who were there and, and basically they would be the ones who would collect the taxes. They were the ones who would sell out their fellow man and, and it was something that, you know, they were, they were betraying them and so it was something that, you know, they, they just weren't well liked. I had watched, uh, we watched a TV series the other day. The um, Chosen. The Chosen. And it was just bringing out, you know, how this tax collector, you know, he had to like pay somebody to be able to like hide him, to be able to bring him basically through to the marketplace. And this man, you know, was, was, was not well liked at all. And it was like when there was festivals and when there was feasts, you know, he didn't have any family that he could even celebrate with because of the situation that he had created by basically, you know, being this outcast, this by selling out, you know, his community. He, he basically, he got wealthy right at the expense of his own people. And, and you know, being Sicilian, that's just something you don't want to do. It's just not cool. And so you yeah. can say that there was a stigma, just like we talked in, in um, the previous weeks about you know, having a stigma attached to who you were. Um, Zacchaeus had a stigma of being a tax collector. That was just, it was frowned upon, and it was something that, it was somebody who was just not liked. But I want to pick up in verse three. It says, he sought to see Jesus uh, who Jesus was. And when it talks about he sought, it means to seek out as in worship to God, which is interesting. And when it says that uh, he sought to see who Jesus was, that word see means to know or understand. And so, you know, we see that Zacchaeus would have heard about Jesus. And I know we, we've said this now the last couple of weeks, but word was getting out about these miracles that Jesus was performing. And so, you know, Zacchaeus probably heard of this and he probably knew, I have to get to know who who this Jesus is, what he's all about, and what can he do for me? And he wanted to know, what was the deal with Jesus? Yep. But it says, there was a problem here. It says, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. He was a little guy. He was, he was a, a wee man. man. Yeah, a wee man, as the song goes. And so we all know by now that Jesus always had a crowd. And so far, this crowd was preventing him from seeing Jesus, simply because, you know what? They were average people. They were average people of average height, but Zacchaeus, he wasn't. He was of short stature. And so this is relevant to us because, you know, see, he had a problem that he couldn't escape. He was short. You know, you know, even in the Word of God, it says, you know, you know, can we add, you know, why worry? It said, you know, because we can't add anything to our height or we can't, you know, do these different things. But it said, because we can't, you know, when you're short, you're short. You know, you're not going to be able to like, you know, sprout up, you know, after you finish growing. And this is the case that this man was in. But I think that we can all relate to this case because, you know, just because he was short 
physically, it doesn't mean that we, that we haven't been short before. I mean, how many of you, you know, have had situations where you're short on the rent or short on tuition or short on influence or maybe you've been short on charisma or wealth or maybe you took a shot and you came up short or maybe, you know, what about that dream you went after and you came up short, you know, or you came up short in a relationship where you got the short end of a stick, you know, maybe an addiction, you know, you put your heart out there and you still ended up, you know, coming up short. You know, there's, it reminds me, you know, I, you know, I think we can all relate to, you know, being short in our lives. It reminds me of a, of a line that I remember hearing once. It said, you know, you have been weighed, you have been measured, you have come up wanting. And I just believe this is the truth of what the matter is. It says, you know, does it really, does it hit home? It says, no matter, I mean, have you ever heard this statement and you've, you've said it yourself? You said, no matter what I do, I just can't win. I just keep coming up short. Zacchaeus had a big butt in his life. You guys ever have a big butt? It was kind of, it kind of went like this. Uh, it didn't matter that he had riches, didn't matter that he had wealth or prominence or power, but he kept coming up short. I have this, but I can't win. I have this, but no one likes me. I have this, but, and that but was a big thing, and this but is what drove him to desperation. He had to see Jesus. He knew that he needed Jesus, and it was that that propelled him to take action, and action is what he did. Mm -hmm. And we know what action he took because it says that he ran ahead. And see, this is the cool part is that Zacchaeus, he knew that there was no way that he was going to be able to get to Jesus if he tried to, like, you know, pick through the crowd and tried to kind of um, just push them aside. He was short. He was small. There was no way he was going to be able to get all the way through the crowd to see Jesus. And so he knew that he had to get ahead of the crowd. He knew he had to outrun them and he had to go to a place where they were not yet there. And he ran ahead and he waited. And that's where the provision was. That's true. And it says that he climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. You know, you know, he threw his, his pride aside. You know, I, we were talking about this earlier. He said, you know, you don't see too many prominent people climbing trees these days. You know, it's like, you know, uh, you know most of the time they probably just cut that tree down before, you know, they were about to climb it. And so it's just the way that things are. And so he, he threw his pride aside and he climbed up this tree. And I think that this is interesting because the tree is a representation of God's provision in our lives. Lives, right? You know, he was short. He had a problem where he was short, but that tree, God filled in the gap with the tree. He made the provision for him to be able to get up to the height that he needed to get up to that day with the tree. And see, God saw that in advance. He's the one who sees and advance our needs. And he sees him when he does this. He said, he planted that tree. God was the one who planted that sycamore tree. It probably took, you know, maybe decades for it to grow, but it was right there at the right place at the right time for Zacchaeus to be able to climb up to get to the height that he needed to climb up to that day. And so God made provision where Zacchaeus was coming up short and he does the same thing in our lives. God makes the provision for us. You see, there's, you know, something about a tree. You know, who, where else do we find provision from? Christ came. He was crucified at the cross. At the cross there's provision, right? It says right in the God's word, right, that, that there's a tree, right? And so it says, I want to read it, it says in, in Romans 3.23, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, this sounds like Zacchaeus' situation. He was short of God's glory this day. And it says that God's provision, it was coming, it was short right for him that day, but that cross, the cross, the tree, right, this was there before him. It set him up, it rose him up to a new height that day so that he could get into the path where Jesus was coming. That's right. And so the next part it says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. And this is the cool thing about this is that it says, when Jesus came to the place. It wasn't that, you know, Jesus came to a place and then all of a sudden Zacchaeus was yelling at him. It says when Jesus came to the place, we all know that the place was a place of provision. It was the sycamore tree where Zacchaeus was in the tree. But I'm, I'm, I want to paint this picture for you is that there, you know, there's masses of people around Jesus as he's walking. And when he gets to the place, it's not like he's going to all of a sudden have this like, oh, look, there's this random tree, you know, in the middle of nobody. And I see it and I see that there's a person in it. No, there's tons of people around. So it's not likely that, you know, it would just stand out that Zacchaeus would stand stand out in that tree. But it says, when Jesus got to the place, 
he looked up and he saw him. And we, we've been talking about, you know, El Roy, he, he's the God who sees us. And he saw and he knew that was the moment where uh, Zacchaeus would be, see, would be saved. And so, um, you know, he caught, it was a divine appointment. And him being in that tree was enough to catch the master's eye. And so he said unto him, and this is the part where, um, you know, I said Zacchaeus didn't have to call down to him and say, you know, like, Jesus, Jesus. Like we heard about that with the blind man with Bartimaeus, he called out to Jesus. But Zacchaeus, it doesn't say that he called out to him. Mm -hmm. It says that Jesus stopped, looked up at him, and when Jesus got to the place, he looked up at him and he said, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. He called him by name. And, and this just shows the relational God that he is, that he sees you, he knows exactly who you are, where you are, and where what, what you'll be doing. He already knew his name, and he knew the desperation that Zacchaeus felt when he realized that no matter what he had, no matter what he did, he was always going to come up short without salvation, without Christ. Mm -hmm. And so as we keep reading on it, it says, make haste. This is what Jesus says. It says, make haste and come down. For today I must abide at your house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And so I just want to touch base on this real quick, which just basically says, you know, that the provisions of God, you know, that tree was there. It was there for that season. It was there for him to be able to be elevated. It was there for him to get into that path where Christ stopped in that place of provision, looked up and saw him. But it's also Christ in that place of provision called him down as Zacchaeus had to make the decision that that tree was a temporal location for him. It was temporal. And so he had to come down from that tree and then he had to be and reside. And it says that he received the Lord gladly that day as he came into his house. And it says in the next verse, it says, and when they saw it, they all murmured. Who saw it? The crowd. We got to love the crowd here. You know, and it's saying that he, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Right? And I, I think this is in an interesting state of events because everyone around saw Zacchaeus for the stigma that was attached to him. They despised him. They despised who he was because he was a tax collector. He was the one who sold out his people. And it says, but, but Jesus saw past the stigma and he valued him for who he was. He write who he was created to be. It says in Psalms 23, 5, it says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You don't need, see, you don't need the validation from the people around you in order to walk in the provision of God, in order to walk in the fullness of what God has for you and what he's created you. You to be. This next part is actually key for me. It's key for you too, hopefully. Um, but Jesus doesn't harp on Zacchaeus when he goes to his house and everything. It doesn't say that Jesus, you know, got on his case and he said, Zacchaeus, you know, you're, you've been a bad man and you've, you know, done this and you've done that and you're terrible and you need to be saved from that and you need to be whole and, and whatever. It doesn't say that Jesus says that, but what it says is that, you know, Zacchaeus began to make restitution, right? Or he, he told God how he was going to make restitution. He says, half my goods I'm going to give to the poor, and anything that he took by false accusation, he would restore fourfold. This is a big deal because... Um, you know, there's that stigma attached to who he was, right? And mm -hmm. and so, you know, he's not even just saying that things that I've gotten, um, you know, by ill-gotten gain or whatever. He's not saying, I'll just restore that. He's saying fourfold. So he's going above and beyond. And Jesus didn't get have to get on his case. And, you know, sometimes we feel that, you know, when we're ministering to sinners or we're ministering to the lost and we we want to tell them you need to clean this up you need to get this right you need to get that right you need to change this and you know what maybe they do Zacchaeus needed his life changed mm -hmm. but you know the war the power of the word of God is is it's powerful enough to change people's lives and sometimes we have to allow the power of God the power of his word to begin that change on the inside mm -hmm. of people and to convict people not to condemn people but to convict them of what they're doing wrong and then the natural reaction would be God I want to restore things I want to make things right again I want to set things at right and so um, when he's saying he's gonna restore fourfold this is a big deal and this phrase actually talks talks about him being 
a fig informer. A fig informer. A fig informer or a sycophant. And a sycophant actually means a parasite, a deceiver, or an imposter. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, you know, it's basically somebody who, it even goes so far to say it's somebody who, you know, through flattery and through, you know, charisma and charm gets things that they want. And so this is what Zacchaeus was known by. He was known to do this. And so now you know the extent of why he's hated. How many know there's people that you can probably think of right now in your own life that do things like this, that they, you know, work their charm or they work, you know, the system so that they can get what they want and figure mm -hmm. things out so that it works in their favor. And, mm -hmm. you know, th like that's that's kind of the way the world is working in this time. Mm -hmm. But it says, and, and so we know that, you know, Zacchaeus was hated in this moment. Mm -hmm. And here he's saying that he's going to make full restitution for all of that, all without Jesus. Ever saying a word. Ever saying a word. Without him harping on him. Mm -hmm. Without him saying, uh, you know, Zacchaeus, you're a bad man. No, the power of who Christ was, the transforming power of him is what began to change Zacchaeus' life. So Jesus finishes up this, this section here, and it says, He said unto him, This day is salvation come to your house. For so much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save which was lost. I think, you know, it says this word seek here, right, is the same word that was used for Zacchaeus, which was seeking Jesus to begin with, right? They were pursuing, he was pursuing God, but God was also pursuing him, right? There was a, there was a provision that was here. God is a God who pursues us, and he was pursuing Zacchaeus this day. And I think that he's a good shepherd, because the word of God says he's a good shepherd. Shepherd. And I think it's relevant here because it says that the good shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one. And it says here that he was a son of Abraham. He may not have been living as a son of Abraham. He may not have been in the sheepfold with the rest of the sons of Abraham. But Christ went to that place that day. He went to the place of provision and he sought out Zacchaeus that day as the good shepherd. And he brought him back into the fold and he said, here is your day of salvation. Here is the day. He's seeking you out. He sees you and he's here to deliver you from the destruction that is in your lives. So here are some thoughts on this, you know. So this was a man, right? This was a parasite, right? He was desperate enough to climb up a tree because all of, all of the butts that he had in his life, all the things that he couldn't escape, all of these things that were going on in his life. But salvation came to his household in the midst of desperation. And now we're going to bring out another story. All right, so this story we're going to um, pull up in the New King James Version, and we're calling this story The Paralytic. And it takes place in Mark's, uh, Mark 2. I'm going to start in verse 1. We're going to go to verse 12. And it says, And again he entered Capernaum and after, uh, after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing him a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. Think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and he went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We've never, we never saw anything like this. We've never seen anything like this. Never before. And so I'm going to pick up, and it says, And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed of which the paralytic was laid. And so I just look at this story like, what love, what faith, what loyalty, what absolute desperation 
and these friends had to get this man in front of Jesus, right? They wouldn't be stopped by a crowd. They weren't going to be stopped by a building. They weren't going to be stopped by a roof, right? They, they went up higher, and then they started even digging down deeper, right? They went up, and then they started digging through. There wasn't a barrier in their mind. There wasn't a barrier on this roof. There wasn't a barrier in the house. There wasn't a barrier in the crowd. They broke through those barriers because they were going to get the master's eye. They were going to get this man in front of him, and I think that this is important to know. I said that, right, that it just, it captured what they needed to capture that day by pressing through and pushing through that barrier in the, in the roof to get that man to where he needed to be. True, and I think there's, there's a key part in this is that, you know, it's talking about there was four men who brought him, and so sometimes, you know, we need to understand that we need the people around us, and there are going to be people that are going to surround you, that are going to help you in your journey, who are going to help propel you into your healing or what you need. And so, you know, there are times, you know, where you feel, you might feel exhausted, whatever you want to kind of push people aside, but know that God is placing people in your life to help you achieve and help you to get to a place where you can receive your healing. We'll yeah. talk about that yeah. a little so, bit more. So it's not just a story about a late man, it's about a story about these men as well, these compassionate, these determined friends, right? Uh, I mean, I, I loved, I mean, it's, it's good to have friends like these men, right? You know, the ones like, you don't have the ability to reach out and take that miracle, but your friends actually do it for you. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven you. But here's the thing, it says, and Jesus said, their faith. He said their faith. He said their faith. It was the friend's faith in this particular situation. And then he spoke to the paralytic, right? They were interceding for him. They were intercessors. And so the Word of God even talks about intercession. I'm going to read just a couple verses. 1 Timothy 2.1. It says, I urge them, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Hebrews 7.25. It says, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And then in Romans 8, 34, it says, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is he who is risen? He, I'm sorry, who is even as at the right hand of God, who always makes intercession for us. This is what these men were doing that day. They were interceding on behalf of this man, this, this paralytic. See, a definition of intercession, it says the action of intervening on behalf of another, prayer or solicitation to one party in favor of another. See, see, Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God. He, he is intervening. He's, it says he's interceding for us there. And these men were making intercession for their friend. They were inter Veening on his behalf. And I just think that is a powerful gift to have friends who are out there interceding and intervening for us. Yeah. It, it's amazing, right? I love how Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven you. And so Jesus breaks the lie by a revelation of the truth here. And, and he had the power to do so. And so Jesus started, sentence, he started his sentence out with son. And God says, you're one of mine. And, you know, words can't even explain the emphasis on the emotional state of this man um, with that one word. You know, it implies that he's family. It implies belonging, sonship, a intimacy. relationship of yep. intimacy mm -hmm. with the Father. And it goes to the heart of, uh, of who he is, of his esteem, his self-worth, and just like the core of his being. But Jesus continued with, your sins are forgiven you. Uh, and so, you know, we've talked previously about, you know, when we were talking about blind Bartimaeus, and we had talked about how, you know, there was a stigma attached with that he was probably blind because of either his sins or sins from, you know, his uh, his parents or or family of, su of such like that. And so it's the same kind of thing here with this man, you know, it, lameness was one of the same things. It was, there was a shame that was attached to it. There was some, a stigma attached to that there was, there must have been sins somewhere down the line. And so whether or not that was true, if it was true that he sinned or his parents sinned and that's why he was paralyzed, um, almost doesn't even matter because what matters is that he believed it and he received all that shame and he wore that shame and he allowed that to define who he was, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, you know, the crowd wasn't just upset with Jesus because he claimed that he could forgive sins. They were upset at the contradiction that this forgiveness had on the judgments uh, that they had on this man, mm -hmm. right? He was a worthless man. 
they didn't believe that he he had any worth in him to be healed. And what Jesus was saying here is that, you know, you are my son. You are my child. You belong to me. And so, you know, um, this man, he, he probably believed all of this too. Like I said, it affected who he was. And so he probably had a feeling of that, you know what, I don't even deserve to be healed. I'm paralyzed because this is my lot in life. This is what I deserve. This is what belongs to me. I can't get rid of it. And it's just, it is what it is, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, he, and Jesus could have healed him that day, just healed his physical body without healing the insides, but if Jesus would have done that, he still would have walked away broken on the inside because Jesus was dealing with who he was at the core, and that was the beginning of his physical manifestation of his healing. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like maybe something that you did caused you to have the lot that you have in life or, you know, maybe where you are in life is a result of the decisions that you made and maybe they do. Maybe they are a result from the decisions that you made in life. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, you had an abortion 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and it's still weighing heavy on your heart and you regret it. Maybe you had an affair. Maybe, you know, you did something. Maybe you lied to get the job that you have right now. Maybe you lied to get money that you have from the mm -hmm. government. You know, maybe you did some of these things, and maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but maybe you feel that you're in this lot in life because of the decisions that you made. Mm -hmm. There is forgiveness, and there is healing, and God wants to heal that shame that goes along with things. When you ask for forgiveness, God grants it, he grants you forgiveness right away, immediately when you repent of your sins. And repentance is a, a complete turnaround. Mm -hmm. Walk in the other way. It's a complete turnaround from your sins. So when you repent of something that you did, if you have a sin in your life or you committed a sin in your life and you repent of it, there is forgiveness immediately right there. And at that moment, you don't have to allow the devil mm -hmm. to um, throw that shame on you, to throw all of that heaviness on you. You don't have to carry that for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people feel that they have to carry this shame with them. They have to carry this lot, this load, this heaviness because they made bad decisions or they mm -hmm. made a poor decision or, or whatever it is. But know that there is healing for your mind today. There's healing for who you are at your core. And when you know that you belong to Christ, when you know that you are called to be his son, you are called to be his daughter, there is healing for your spirit and your physical manifestation can begin to, to play out. To, to Your body can begin to be healed in that moment. Mm -hmm. So I, I just I said, it's just breaking off the power of the words that stick on people. I just believe that that was part of what Christ did that day is he broke that man free from the power of the words, the stigmas that were attached, the shame that was attached to this man because he had to heal those. But otherwise, he would have walked away still feeling like he was an inferior person. And so he walked away in that freedom this day. And here that Christ says, it says in verse number 11, it says, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately, he says he arose. He took up his bed and he went out in the presence of them all. And they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never have seen something like this. So this is what I want to say here. It says that he had come to be, he came in and he was, he had to be carried because he didn't have the strength or the faith to be able to do such. So others had to use their strength. They had to use their faith. But when he left that day, he walked out on his own accord. And I think there's something powerful here that we need to really capture. It says here that Jesus said, arise. And that word means, it means more than just simply get up. This is a Greek word, which is angerio, which it means to waken, to rouse from sleep or death or even obscurity. It means to emerge from below the horizon and become apparent, even like the sun rising up, to ascend to a higher place, to begin to act or even to exert power. Do you realize what God was really saying in this situation and what he was doing in this man's life? He was taking him from below 
below the horizon. He was taking him from obscurity. He was taking him from the grave. And he was breathing life back into him that day. He was resurrecting that man's spirit that day. He was bringing him up. He was breathing in that life of God. And as he went, he said resurrection life came into him. He was just, he was in this place where that man was paralyzed on his bed. But he's no longer going to be paralyzed because God was breathing life into them. He had no strength to get up. Carried in on other people. And that could be a situation where you're in, where you don't have the faith. You don't have the encouragement. But God is there because your friends are there. They can help you. God can help you. They can raise you up. They can bring you to this place. They can put a new opportunity upon your on your winds today and rise you up. Raise you up to that new place. Raise you up. Arise, it says. Arise. And I just want that to connect with someone's spirit today. Arise. It's bringing you to a new horizon. It's bringing you out of the place of the dead. It's bringing you to a new life. It's emergence. Rise. Arise. That's what it's saying. I just want to say, you know, before we kind of close up here is that, you know, um, is it easier to say to you that your sins are forgiven? Mm -hmm. Or is it easier to say to you, just arise, mm -hmm. take up your bed and walk. Mm -hmm. And this is the day where, like Pastor Brian's saying, is that, you know, we are called to rise up. We are called to be everything that God has created mm -hmm. us to be, to walk in the fullness of who he's created us to be. We can strip off these weights that are holding us back. We can strip off the shame that is trying to keep us um, uncovered and, and in the back. It, we, can, we can strip off all of this, um, all of the stigmas that either word curses have put on our life or what people say about us or what people think about us or maybe even what our reputation has been in the past. And it's time now where we can say, I'm going to separate from that identity. I'm going to set that stigma aside and I'm going to begin to stand up for who God has called me to be. I am going to arise in the calling that God has put before me mm -hmm. and I'm going to pick up my cross and I am going to follow him with my whole heart and I'm going to give him everything. And this day, healing is available for you. This day, there's a miracle that's waiting for you to just reach out. There's a miracle that's waiting for you to just rise mm -hmm. up off your bed and to let that shame be stripped out of your life this day. We don't have to be condemned. We don't have to be pressed down, but we can rise up this day in Jesus' name and we can be the very best of who he's created us to be because he's put a very specific purpose in your life. He has you here for a reason. You're in this moment today right here for such a time as this and he has something special for you to do mm -hmm. in this moment. Yep. Amen. And I think there's one more part in this that I want to I want to capture as we close up. It says here, it says, and he went out in the presence of them all. And and I think, you know, not only did God come in that day and he, he alleviated his shame, he brought him into this new place. He fixed this man's self-esteem. He healed the man. He did all of these things. But the best part here is that he did it in a room full of his haters. He went in there, and it says, you know, when I said we talked about earlier, it says, you know, God prepares a table in the midst, a feast in the midst of his enemies that day. And this man, God was just saying, right, like, he came in. It didn't matter what was surrounding him. It didn't matter the environment it was in. God still chose to bless this man. He chose to set this man free, and he did it in the midst of people who were hating him, right? And so it says, and then it says, they were all amazed and glorified, saying, what? We've never seen anything like this, right? And I believe it said, you know, they didn't see anything like this at this time, but I also believe that God isn't done with you. I believe that they're magnifying God. They're going to glorify God over your life. They're going to glorify God over your testimony. They're going to glorify over the, the fact that you're emerging onto a new horizon this day. I believe that all glory is going to go to God about the testimony, the beacon of hope that is your life this day, that God is transitioning you, that God has seen you. He's, he, you've got the eye of the master. He's pursuing you this day, and he's, he's there. He's performing the miracle, right? And when it says arise, there's an emergence that's taking place, right? And I just believe that, that there's importance and I just of the don't last want, part that I really liked. It is a good part. Mm -hmm. And I just want to encourage you, don't forget that last portion, even what Pastor Brian was just saying there, is that the glory went to God. Mm -hmm. They glorified God. And so don't let your miracles go to waste. Don't hide your miracles under, you know, a rug or, or pass them aside or brush them off as something little. 
let the glory go to God and give him all the glory, give him all the praise because he deserves it. He is the God most high and he loves you. He sees you. He is El Roy, the God who sees and he sees you in this moment right he here, right now. That's right. Let's, Let's pray. pray. Okay. Father God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are El Roy. I thank you, Father God, that you see us. I thank you, Father, that you have seen the desperation in the hearts of men and women this day. And I pray, Father God, that you will be with them. I thank you, Lord, that you are just causing them to arise this day, that you're healing the brokenness of their hearts this day. The Father, that you're putting them on a whole new horizon. I thank you, Father God, that you are breathing life. You're breathing, breathing resurrection into them. I thank you, Father God, that you're pursuing them, that they have your eye. I thank you, Father God, that you see them this day. And I pray, Father God, that your anointing would rest upon them. I thank you, Father, that you're breaking barriers in their lives and setting them free. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that the desperation in their hearts, the cry of God, Father God, that is moving forth and causing their faith to arise this day. I thank you, Lord, that their faith is arising and it's speaking forth, Father, and it's putting action, Father God, to their faith. And I thank you, Lord, that they've called out upon you. You see them this day. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, you've set them free and delivered them. And I thank you, Lord, that all glory will be given to God and the testimony of their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to let you guys know that we're, you guys are blessed. I want you guys to have a great night. We just love you guys. We appreciate you guys. And I want you guys to know that desperation, it's there. I want you guys to just walk away. I want you to feel the life of God. I want you to have that zeal, that hunger on the inside and know that you've caught the Lord's eye and know that he's pursuing you in the name of Jesus. Have a great night.